Hello, dear colleagues. I'm very happy that you're here and uh, I'll start by introducing myself and what I'm going to talk about. And uh, we'll use this time also for other people to, to get in. So uh, maybe some of you already know me. I'm Dr. Nan Stankovic. I come from Belgrade, Serbia. I have my own practice and for the last like uh, eight years, I'm also doing uh, workshops specifically in hyaluronic fillers, mesotherapy and uh, chemical peels. I'm key opinion leader for uh, uh, some uh, very famous brands uh, around the globe. And also I've traveled to the major congresses uh, on the, almost every continent except Australia where I haven't been so far. So anybody here from Australia, if, if they want to, uh, you know, um, call me, I would gladly come. But of, of course, after the Corona epidemic uh, finishes until then, we'll stay online and uh, we will uh, see each other through this magnificent technology. And uh, uh, what I'm going to, uh, to talk today is actually about the upper third. Of course, majority of you know that the hyaluronic fillers uh, in upper third are not usually the most common indication to work with. Usually we work with uh, neuromodulators, meaning botulinum toxin, but of course, when we have the issue with the volume loss, we do need to uh, inject uh, hyaluronic fillers in that part. And uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, uh, today. Of course, first thing we are going to speak about the anatomy because uh, the anatomy is the guidance in this part because knowing the anatomy will have the better results and much more, much less complications in this part. So uh, I would also like to ask you to put your comments and questions in Q&A, meaning questions and answers. This is the specific part in this uh, application where you can uh, uh, ask the questions and I'm going to answer probably most of the questions at the end of the um, uh, at the end of this lecture so, so stay tuned so at the beginning uh, we're going to speak as i said about the uh, anatomy and let me just change to the presentation so as you can see here i would like also to uh, thank swiss cell and the Aproline brand for having me here and I've also been uh, uh, speaking for them for the last two years and it was really nice time with them with, because the company is very supportive and uh, giving a lot of uh, uh, help with it. So when we speak about the aging phenomena, we definitely know that it is multifactorial, meaning we cannot just say that it is the skin that loses the quality, the thickness, then during uh, that because of the sun, you know, it gets elastosis, the hyperpigmentation. And so, of course, this is something we see at our patients. The first thing we see is what it happens on the skin. But the majority of the things that do happen are below the skin. So we do lose the fat because the loss and the migration of the, the fat, which is supporting actually the, uh, the skin, is changing the volume and shape of the face. Then we have, of course, the changes of the muscle because the muscles are here also very important. They do change their characteristics when we age, specifically uh, the ones that we see is here on the platysma, where we see those platysmal bands as far as we age. Some people that are, you know, even younger, but they are predisposed uh, for that. They have those uh, platysmal bands, uh, bands earlier in the life, maybe in the late 40s and uh, 50s, but all of us will probably get them 
at the age of 70 if we live to that. And then, of course, there's the bone. We, you, we lose the bone, which is actually the supporter of all the uh, soft tissues on top of that. When we speak about the facial fat compartments, we usually speak first about the superficial ones. And on the, uh, uh, the right and down picture, we definitely see those uh, facial, uh, superficial facial fat compartments. They are numbered by one, two, three, uh, three and four. This is the nasolabial fat compartment, number one, medial fat compartment, number two, uh, middle fat compartment, number three, and number four is the lateral fat compartment. They usually tend to decrease during the age. Uh, of course, the nasolabial fat compartment either does not decrease or maybe increases in the uh, uh, in the volume. And of course, uh, around the eye, where you, you see the skin, in the upper part of the orbicularis oculi muscle, you see that the skin is very, very thin, as it is see-through skin. So all the things that happened around there are easily seen and because we don't have the fatty tissues below that and in the lower part we have the fatty tissues and that's why it is uh, definitely less visible when it's there and specifically the fatty tissues as we see it here it changes during the the age and then we have some uh, things because also of the specific uh, posture of the ligaments here, specifically the uh, loose skin combined with the, uh, uh, with the fat compartments here tends to have uh, to create the jowls and that is something we don't like. Then we have of course the changes into the, uh, in the, the bones and you can see here that actually the bone matrix, matrix changes with agents and that is uh, changing the support that we have on the, on the soft tissues and that's why we have the loss. And this specifically you can see here around Orbita that in the younger patient we have the, um, uh, okay, uh, we have the Orbita that has a much less surface and in the elder, elderly age, we have the orbita that is quite bigger, and then we have the sunken um, uh, eye, uh, eyes there, so it changes during the age as well. This is a very interesting uh, uh, scientific work by Cotofana that showed that actually there is the change of calvaria, calvarial volume, meaning the top of the skull that changes through the age and you can see here that it is a little bit different in males and females the blue uh, lines are for males and the um, uh, red lines are for females but generally what you see that during the ages it changes quite specifically uh, there is the difference of, of more than 5%, which is around 60 to 70 milliliters. So now we are speaking that actually only in this part we have a change of 60 to 70 milliliters, which is like transferred to the HA uh, syringes, meaning 60 to 70 syringes of loss just here. So this is something that we have to bear in mind. Then there, also, there is also the change of height in the mid phase. And you can see here that this change is substantial as well, that the height of the mid phase decreases more in males, about 10%, and a little bit less in females, about 6 to 7% during the age, which is again very, very important. So there is a quite of change 
in the bone. And also there is the change of thickness about two millimeters per, uh, per bone. We have the loss in thickness, which is now the, 30, the 230 milliliters or cubic centimeters of volume. We have now more than 230 milliliters of volume loss just due to the decreased thickness of the bone. Combined with those 70 that we use in calvarian volume, we now have at least 300 milliliters of volume loss, which is like a good glass of water, even a little bit less, even a little bit more. But just imagine that majority of patients coming into your practice, and when you say, okay, you need at least three syringes of the acrylamide filler to, uh, to see actually the difference between before and after, they would say, oh, is that really too much? Is that really necessary? Well, it is necessary because actually you lost 10 times more, not 10 times, 100 times more, specifically in the elderly age. So we should start doing fillers as soon as there is the indication. So if there is the indication in 20s, yes, why not? Of course, in 30s, there is definitely the indication to do the treatment, and that is when usually majority of the patients do start. Okay, so in the uh, majority of the areas of the face, we have those seven layers, and specifically in the area of the uh, temporal part, we have the layer number one, which is the skin. Then we have the layer number two and three, which is the subcutaneous fat and the superficial temporal fascia. Under that, we have the deep fat, which is in the uh, area of the uh, temporal fossa, which is actually the deep temporal fascia. And then we have the layer six and seven, which is the deep uh, uh, fascia. And then we have the muscle. The muscle here is actually in the spot of temporal fossa because the temporal muscle is a very strong muscle that is connected to the coordinate processes of the mandibula. So it helps us bite, of course and it is very strong and specifically it is connected to the bone because it really needs to, to be something like that. And of course, the layer arrangement of the uh, soft tissues and of course the underlying uh, bony tissues can be identified in all facial regions. Can be a little bit different, but it's definitely there. And when we speak about the uh, soft tissues, we also have to speak about the ligaments. And uh, in this case, we have some real ligaments. So when we're speaking about the real ligaments, we're speaking about the ligaments that do connect at uh, to some part of the bony structure. And then on the face, they do connect on the other part, on the, uh, on the soft tissue, and the skin, and this is something that is very important here. So when we are going from above to, uh, to down, we have temporal ligamentous adhesion, and we have the lateral orbital thickening, zygomatic ligament, and mandibular ligand. What you actually don't see when the picture is like this, is when we make um, a drawing and we connect all the dots, we actually have a line that is quite vertical. And that vertical line shows us actually very important thing that when we have it to inject at the part medially to this line, what we actually have there is voluminization, but we connect, if we inject laterally to that part. So 
on the lateral part, when we inject the hyaluronic fillers, we inject them here for voluminization and lifting effect. So we're not going to have the lifting effect here, only voluminization and projection. But at the lateral part of this, we're going to have the lifting effect and of course the volumization itself. So this is something that is very, very important. And specifically about uh, temporal fossa, as I already told you, we have six uh, layers here and we can definitely see them. It is very important, the, the layer number three, where we have the superficial, uh, superficial temporal uh, fascia or temporal parietal fascia, which also holds the vessels that are there. And we have to be very, very cautious about that. That's why we have to uh, really think about the, um, the type of injection that we are going to do. And on the right side, you see a, a picture of the uh, temporalis muscle that is definitely cover and holding inside of the uh, uh, of the temporal fossa. It is the uh, the, the the muscle that is uh, uh, pretty flat, but also very very strong. So when we have the cadaver dissection, and after taking off. The, the, the skin on this part, we definitely can see where the, this is the black arrow. We see the frontal branch of superior temporal artery. So also we have to be careful when we are treating the, the forehead there because we have here this vessel that is uh, kind of a, uh, you know, big and also very important and sp the specific thing about these vessels is they can have uh, some of them are uh, from external uh, carotid uh, artery and one of them is uh, also from internal carotid artery and they can uh, you know uh, have anastomosis and if you injection with a huge pressure we can have a problem of embolism of the uh, internal carotid artery and of course the type of blindness, which is something we definitely do not want uh, to have because the major in majority of the cases we have the case of blindness, the, um, uh, the possibility to uh, reposition the, you know, the site is very, very uh, low. And again, there is the picture on the cadaver where we see the roof, which is the retro orbicular oculi fat. And this fat is uh, generally, uh, when we, we, we look at you know, the skin, there is uh, uh, after the eyebrow. So it is the very important injection site where we are going to, to put our fillers when we do need to reposition the eyebrow and also with the black arrow we see the supraorbital neurovascular bundle which is meaning the uh, uh, nervus uh, supraorbitalis and then of course with the uh, red uh, uh, red arrow we see the uh, orbicularis oculi muscle well, which is there in that part as well which is also again very important and from just uh, almost the same uh, picture but from a different angle we uh, see a little bit better this supraorbital neurovascular bundle and the nerve itself and of course uh, majority of you know that when we press here we can usually you feel it and uh, uh, also on the patient uh, this is very important because uh, when you are um, injecting in this part you have to be careful about the supratrochlear and the supraorbital nerve in that part. Of course uh, we should speak about the danger zones and we know that there are arteries and blood vessels all around the face, specifically the face is highly, highly vascularized. And actually this is me, you know, in different positions. And you can see 
that there are uh, major, major arteries uh, all across, and we have to be sure, uh, you know, to know what is the position of the supratrochlear artery, what is the position of the supra orbital artery, then the zygomaticofacial artery, and of course the uh, temporal arteries, and uh, you know, they are here and uh, they do change the depth when they uh, uh, travel to the soft tissue. And now we can definitely speak about the treatment options, okay? So, uh, you know, when a patient comes to your office, you always have to, uh, to be sure that the patient is in good health in order to undergo these procedures. So what is good health? Uh, not just the physical health, but also the mental health. And uh, in majority cases, you know, that I did not do the procedure what was because of the uh, physical health, because there were some contraindications on that part. Hope, uh, thankfully, they are not that uh, frequent, but you know, you always have to ask and to be careful in these parts what are you going to do with the patient? And I'm sorry for those patients that I had to say no, because they had some of the physical issues with the health. But I'm very happy that I said no for the patients that had some mental issues. And you can definitely uh, have uh, the biggest problem with those patients because those patients that they are having uh, like uh, uh, body dysmorphic disorder, you know, they are never satisfied with you. Then the patients that uh, are coming to you there when they're having some unrealistic expectations, also not a good, uh, uh, not a good uh, options for be being treated because they're never, never going to be satisfied with you and you know, on those patients because uh, they probably changed all your colleagues that are, you know, in some radius around you and none of them was proficient enough to deal with them and then they come to you as well. And if you think you are the greatest doctor that you can do what others fail to, probably it's not going to be, uh, to be like that. And of course, you know, there are also patients that they have been treated uh, at the office of another doctor with some unregistered and unknown products. And then because they are not satisfied with well, what they achieved, they come to you and say, okay, I just need like a little touch up and then I'm going to be satisfied and I have to say that although they probably never react uh, like, uh, you know, with the upper hands and say, okay, you do whatever you want, just get rid of this. They usually say, oh, that will cost me a lot. And of course, if I did not provide a problem for the patient, if I have to apply healing days, then of course, I'm going to charge them for the treatment of the uh, uh, you know, um, healing days, and then I'm going to charge them for the additional fillers because I have to work on a clear site. And then I know that if any problem occurs, it's because my work and not of the work of uh, other doctor that treated the patient before me. So this is something that I also tend to uh, to use in my practice, and this is something many patients don't, don't like, but those that do, uh, you know, apply for that, they are then satisfied. And then when we come to the, uh, uh, to the uh, exact moment where we speak with the patient what there is to be treated of them, we have to assess the, them individually. So because every one of us has a unique anatomy and of course there's the specific dynamics and of course 
the resting conditions. And this is something we have to be aware of. And of course, you should uh, speak with them in the upright position. And usually I look at them while, they, while I ask them, okay, why did you come to me? And what is that I can do for you? And although I always listen to them, so I listen to their problems and I listen to their wishes, but I don't always do, you know, um, uh, do by them their wishes because I'm not a Santa Claus. I don't fulfill the wishes because when I have a patient that has uh, something that in my op opinion, in my case, is not beautiful or it's not normal, not, it is too exaggerated. Like you can see uh, a lot of patients like that on the street where you go out, I don't do that as well, which is like maybe a financially um, like a disaster because those patients do pay well, but I really like when my patients look natural and uh, I'm really help, happy when they come to me and they say, you know, all the uh, colleagues in my work really saw that I look more beautiful, but they don't know what I have done. And usually it looks like they have been on some kind of a vacation or something like that. So uh, the first like indication where, which we are going to speak in the upper third of the face is definitely the glabella line. And uh, in this case, of course, you should do neuromodulator, meaning the botulinum toxin in this case. So you can choose whatever botulinum toxin is registered in your country. So of course, there are some uh, unregistered and please don't do that. Uh, but with registered ones, please use them. Of course, if you have a patient that comes from abroad or far away, you can do that at the same uh, uh, treatment. So at the same moment, not a problem. You just have to know what is going to happen in the future with the combination of the botulinum toxin and hyaluronic filler. But of course, because here we're speaking about the uh, injection of the hyaluronic fillers, we are going to inject the hyaluronic filler. The cases where I do inject the hyaluronic filler is the case where I see there is the static wrinkle that is deep and when injected with the botulinum toxin, it's not going to disappear. So when we inject the botulinum toxin in the part of the uh, glabella, we're going to diminish the mim uh, mimetic movements of the muscle, but that is not going to fill the uh, static wrinkles that are here and that are deep. Of course, with doing many frequent um, uh, treatments with botulinum toxin, for a longer period of time, maybe one year, maybe two years, you're going to have the effect of filling the wrinkle. But for the patient that would want a very fast result, you're not going to get it just by inserting the uh, uh, botulinum toxin. So you have to combine it with the glabella, uh, with the injection of the hyaluronic fillers. So in this part, it is very uh, problematic because what we have here, actually, when you, when you have those uh, lines that are here, what you actually have is below that, you have arteria supratrochlear. So it's very, very problematic. And one of the most frequent problems in the cases of necrosis of the tissues is when we are doing the injections in this part. So again, we have to be very superficial in this area around 
two to three uh, centimeters above the eyebrow line because in this part, the, the artery supertrochlearis is very deep. So we have to be superficial, but then it changes its depth to being deep. So where, uh, to being superficial, so where it's superficial, we have to be deep just to be uh, like that. So we're going to inject it with the uh, injection that is almost parallel or at a very sharp angle to the skin. And we're going to inject uh, deep dermis or uh, subdermally with the hyaluronic filler and be again superficial. So in this part, what we're going to use from Epriline uh, line of fillers is the Epriline Normal, which is uh, the product that is uh, uh, with the less uh, 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 size of the particles and of course the uh, concentration of the, not the concentration, concentration is the same, but the cross-linking uh, uh, thing, the cross-linking here is less. So this is the area that we are going to do. On the left picture, you definitely see a cadaveric dissection and you should see that the, with the tip of the needle, that is where you should be very superficial because at the depth, you will have the artery and this is where you should not apply. So with the glabella line, be very, very uh, cautious. And of course, uh, in this part, I also use cannula. So using the cannula, you can have the uh, much uh, less chance that you're going to hit, hit the vessel because you're going to get inside the skin with the blunt cannula and the blunt cannula. If it is uh, with the proper gauge, you're not going to get inside the vessel. So here, 25 gauge or uh, thicker is uh, appropriate. So, but because of the uh, the skin, I usually use it with the 25th, 25th gauge. Of course, we uh, again have the superficial wrinkle correction. And these are the wrinkles that we uh, see when the, uh, when the patient is, uh, you know, making this surprise, uh, surprise motion. And uh, these are the horizontal wrinkles that once again, are beautifully corrected with botulinum toxin. But, uh, you know, in, my, in, in a case where you have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, sun damage and the loss of uh, uh, supporting tissue, then you definitely need, it, need to correct it with the, um, uh, with the hyaluronic uh, filler. And what we're going to use here, this is the, uh, the technique of the, linear injection and it can be either retrograde or it can be anterograde technique. And although the majority of us are used to the uh, retrograde technique, meaning that we inject the needle inside of the skin and then while taking the needle out, we press the, the plunger of the syringe and then we take out the uh, hyaluronic acid, which is definitely much more easier because first we think about the injection and then we think about the volume that we are going to apply in this part. But just think about the next uh, uh, option. The next option is actually putting the hyaluronic filler going before your needle. So in this, this case, you have two major, uh, major um, benefits. And the first benefit is applied to all the fillers, whether they do have the anesthetic inside or not. And the thing is the hyaluronic acid goes through the skin and actually that little bolus in, uh, uh, in front of the needle is pulling those small vessels aside and the, uh, the needle itself is gliding. So now we have a much easier and a much more safer 
application of the uh, uh, needle inside of the um, of the wrinkle and of course in case of the filler that has lidocaine inside this uh, epiline normal is without the lidocaine but there's also the option with the lidocaine uh, you can definitely have another benefit and that benefit is less pain because actually when in contact with the soft tissue the lidocaine from the uh, hyaluronic acid is going to have that uh, effect actually of anesthetizing the tissue and the injection is going to be much more uh, you know comfortable and so then again this is the application of the uh, hyaluronic acid inside of the wrinkle but this is a specific technique called the stretching technique. This is like uh, just a specific thing that is the uh, injection of linear, okay, linear uh, injection, whether retrograde or anterograde, that depends on you, but I already uh, told you what are the benefits of one or the other. But the, the addition in this technique is that we have the helping hands either by your assistant or by yourself with your non-dominant non-injection hand you actually stretch the the skin and what you have is actually the stretched skin and of course when you inject the hyaluronic acid inside what you actually get is you just see how the uh, hyaluronic acid gets inside and it is impossible for you to overfill because you have the stretched skin and this is the option specifically intended in this part because in this part if you get a little bit of overfill you will see those nasty lines that you probably overcorrected and sometimes even because of the ligaments here and, and the septa you cannot um, uh, you know, uh, smoothed by massage. So this is a very nice technique to cover here. Then of course, we don't have just the wrinkles there. We have the volume correction as well. We also know that we have like uh, uh, concave, right? Uh, look of the uh, the forehead but in the cases of uh, loss of volume or some genetic uh, uh, dysmorphism we can have like a little bit of um, no, so concave is going like this and convex is like this so it should be convex so we should also add volume Okay, so we add volume, and in this case, we add it by little bit, little aliquots, meaning a little boluses that are in this part rather subcutaneous, because in this part we know that the arteries and veins are now deep. So this is how we inject in this part, and. Uh, because of this, when we inject it, we have the rise, the giving of the volume to this part. So this is the bolus injection. And um, I also advise you to aspirate. And uh, uh, just a couple of days ago with a very thick filler, I aspirated uh, uh, in uh, a blood in the uh, fossa piriformis, around fossa piriformis, so it is possible. Of course, it's not always true that you're going to uh, aspirate, so in many cases you will have a false negative aspiration, but you are going to be inside of the, the vessel. In majority of the cases, uh, this is true, but just in the cases of the, when you're not you know, when, when there is the 
true positive you're going to have what is you know really a blood in your syringe and then you need to change the needle and you have to change the uh, uh, part where you inject so uh, you're going to use uh, like a vertical serial puncture technique that you're going to implement it here when you're of course using the uh, uh, the needle itself but you're going to use cannula as well to give the volume here and the cannula here is something that is going to help you but cannula is not almighty that can do whatever you want it is just a little bit uh, more secure sometimes more difficult sometimes more easier to, to to work with depending on the area of the face but you know having the possibility to choose whether you're going to work with the uh with the needle or the cannula actually gives you a lot of possibilities so in this case we can do uh do it with the cannula itself and uh, we're going to have the injection point that is almost there to the hairline and we are going to use that injection point to go generally across those uh, horizontal lines and when we cross them we're going actually to to fill them and of course for all of you knowing about the case of myomodulation the myomodulation is the possibility of a hyaluronic uh, acid because it has volume to uh, have also the effect on the uh, muscle itself. So it's not just the botulinum toxin that is uh, uh, creating the change on the motion of the um, of the muscle, but also it is the hyaluronic acid. So if we inject with the cannula the hyaluronic acid above the muscle, what we're going to have, we're going to have the hyaluronic acid that is across the muscle and that chronic acid is going to have a pressure on the muscle and the muscle itself is going to be less uh, uh, less powerful in the motion so it's going to uh, have a less motion and of course the patient will have much less wrinkling on the face there so this is something that is uh, really really interesting that because not just using botulinum toxin you toxin you can interfere with the motion of the uh, the muscle by in injecting the uh, the the filler and of course you can increase the uh, strength of the muscle by applying the uh, hyaluronic acid below it and because of the resting position of the muscle that you are going to change the, the muscle itself can pull a little bit stronger or in the rest of the position is going to generally uh, be um, you know with uh, actually seen like a shorter and you have uh, a visible lifting on the face and for the deeper injections we're going to use the line forte which is intended for the uh, volume loss and the correction in the parts of the uh, chin nose the uh, um, uh, uh, the cheeks and of course in the uh, upper, the, upper third, the temporal fossa so we already spoke about the layers in temporal fossa and what we have to be aware is actually the danger zone so here in superficial temporal uh, temporal frontal fat which is elevated and in the uh, uh, superficial uh, in the uh, superficial temporal uh, uh, fascia we have the superficial temporal artery and we have to be careful not to inject inside of the superficial temporal artery so because this is superficial and when we go deep 
you know, to the bone, we have at the layer six, we have the muscle. The muscle is a safe ground. In this area, even if we inject in the muscle, we are not going to have the migration. But uh, if we tend to inject inside of the, yeah, um, you know, below the muscle, that is actually when where the injection with the needle should be. But also be advised that there is the, uh, of course, uh, apart from this anatomical danger that we should definitely be careful with, we should uh, also uh, cautiously choose the length of the needle. So these two needles are of different length. The one is half gauge and the other one is uh, uh, three quarter of a, of a gauge, meaning the one is uh, 12 or 13 millimeters and the other one is 19 millimeters. And that actually can cause quite a difference because uh, when you see on this uh, graphic in the case when you have the shorter needle, you can get, you should probably not easily get to the bone. So what you're going to do, you're going to probably eject at the level of the deep uh, temporal fascia, which also carries uh, 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 artery there, and you can have a problem with that. But if you are doing it with the 19 uh, millimeters uh, length of the needle, you are going to get to the pericranium and the bone itself, there is a very, uh, very um, safe area to do. And of course, as the Arthur Swift would say, uh, you should use one over and one up, meaning you're going to get uh, one centimeter from the uh, uh, ridge of the uh, supra. Uh, of the uh, uh, superior orbital line and one inside. So this is actually the place where you're going uh, uh, to inject safely. And of course, you have to be careful, even if you are with the aspiration getting the uh, negative uh, sign that uh, you are generally extra vascular, so not intravascular, uh, you may pass through the uh, vessel. So when you definitely pass through the vessel, and this is of, of course in this area very common, uh, what you should have, uh, what you should have do is you get the pressure after you take out the needle. So although you don't have, you don't see the the blood coming out you do the pressure for a couple of minutes because maybe at the area of deep temporal fascia, you touched uh, or, or uh, perforated the vessel and then you can have the ecchymosis and the bruising there. So just to be sure that you're not going to have a bruising like that, like that you put the pressure and maybe an ice pack there and you're going to be, the operation going, is going to be much, much better. So in this case, as I told you, the long needle goes all the way to the pericranium and the, and the bone, and a short needle can be like uh, subcutaneous and, or intramuscular or even in a vessel. So you definitely have to change your technique. And of course, uh, in this area as well, uh, using a cannula uh, is also important. Um, so I would advise you to use not just one, but two of them. So the first thing you're going to jet, inject really deep, okay, really deep with the needle all the way to the bone. And usually you're going to have uh, like uh, 0.5, maybe 0.75 mLs, and usually this is going to be just enough. But of course, 
this is to volumize those sunken temples and we call this the gunshot technique and this gunshot technique is quite uh, easy to use and don't be scary when you're going at, at least for me it was scary for the first time that i've done it a couple of years ago that generally the needle was just going through the soft tissue and going and going and going and it took like for a while to get to the bone and at the moment i was scared because you know i heard some uh, uh stories about a doctor somewhere you know injecting inside of the brain itself and that is also a possibility because the lamina there is very thin so you have to be aware when injecting to inject slow and to see you know to feel actually where you are so when you do it with the needle when you volumize under the muscle then what you do you apply it with the cannula and in a fanning technique you cover this area with the filler and then you're having going to have a much better results so of course you have to think about uh, the uh, feminine and the uh, uh, masculine um, attributes of the face uh, in this in this area uh, like being um, you know um, oblique is more masculine so don't overfill with the female or you're going to masculinize them and uh, uh, this is something that you have also to take care of and of course there's the eyebrow lifting like the last uh, last week i think i had a webinar about the the use of uh, lifting threads for the foxy eyes treatment and we had like more than 400 people attending the webinar which was like really really awesome but of course uh, in majority of the cases you can get quite well with the uh, result of the eyebrow lifting with the hyaluronic filler. In this case as well, we're going to use the bolus technique that we are going to apply all the way to the bone. And we're going to, to apply it in this area that I already told you about, the roof, retro orbic orbiculars oculi uh, fat, which is now diminished. And when we apply it, usually, in the one or in the two or three uh, injections when we are using the needle. So when we're using the needle, we're going to use it like this. So perpendicular to the bone, we inject to the bone, all the way to the bone, uh, little aliquots, probably uh, 0 0.2, maybe 0 0.15, and definitely not more than 0 0.3 in this area because we don't want to over exaggerate because if we have a very strong, um, uh, like this eyebrow ridge, this is something like, uh, you know, looking like a little, more, little bit more Neanderthal, but just a little bit of lifting there can be achieved with hyaluronic filler because when we inject in this part, we are going to have a tri-dimensional change inside, uh, inside of, of the, uh, below the skin because we will see the eyebrow vertically lifting, but also when we look on the patient from the side, we will, we will see that the horizontal projection is also changed and this is something that uh, gives a very nice uh, activity with the and uh, um, with the patient and of course we can use a cannula in that part as well because uh, uh, cannula uh, is very nice to use there uh, but of course um, uh, we don't use it perpendicularly we use it parallel to the to the bone we get inside uh, the skin and below uh, below the muscle and we we inject there and as far as we don't go past the line of supra orbital uh, foramen uh, it's not going to be painful but if you want to do it on the full uh, length of the eyebrow 
here and on the supra uh, trochlear notch, you will have a pain with the patient. So probably you should stick to the uh, lateral portion of the brow where you can uh, definitely lift the brow. Once again, we need a harder filler for that and we are going to use Forte. So Forte is the uh, choice of the filler to use at this part and uh, this is the, uh, you know, on the patient, how to use it with the filler and you press your little pinky uh, below there. So you be sure that actually the filler you eject don't go below the line where you want the filler to stay. And once again, you go all the way to the bone with the bolus technique, with the small aliquots, Yet the lateral part of the eyebrow, you don't have any of the major um, arteries. You, of course, have the capillars, but not the arteries and the veins. So you're pretty much safe there. So how do we avoid the complications? And definitely in this part, as we know, because specifically with the glabella, we have a lot of complications. And this is the excellent knowledge of the facial anatomy. So for all of us, uh, you know, uh, I thought that I know a lot of uh, anatomy specifically from the courses that I have at the, at the university, but it's always advisable to uh, uh, read a little bit more and specifically uh, because, you know, even the anatomy changes, not like that it changes with ourselves that fast, but what we know about the anatomy changes and specifically something that uh, was not known uh, like almost 20 years when I started uh, at the university and having the anatomy, uh, you know, they did not know about the superficial fat compartments. They all thought like this is, this was like just like the fatty mass that goes all around and it's the same, but now we know that those are the compartments. Of course, specifically for the dangers, we should know where, how deep we have the uh, vessels, the blood vessels, the arteries and the uh, veins are going. And of course, well, the, uh, the uh, uh, nerves there. Then we should uh, uh, put the comprehensive history. So we should ask the patient all the treatments that they uh, have done before. And then uh, of course, are there any problems with health issues? And we should definitely talk about, you know, the results, what do they accept, uh, expect from the results? I am a little bit dry. And of course, as I said, we should speak with the, with the patient. And while we're speaking with the patient, we should assess their individual unique anatomy under demand, dynamic and resting conditions. And there's no better dynamic condition than while they talk and they don't think about how they present themselves. And of course, we should present the appropriate, the best hygiene during the treatments so uh, proper disinfection, proper uh, uh, gloves uh, and the syringes uh, for uh, only one use. And of course, we should uh, speak with the patients about the aftercare treatment, you know, uh, after the, the, the injection, because uh, I had like three, or five, three to five patients so far that had any infection after the treatment. And this is because mainly they were kissing their dogs after they, they leave the office and they had some uh, bacterial infection that of course we cured with not a, uh, not a lot of problem, but you know, it happens. So you have to speak with them to death. So uh, once again, uh, thank you all for listening to me. And now we're going to answer the Q and A uh, I'm going to um, uh, just let me check out to stop. Okay, now uh, you can, uh, do you see me?
okay. Okay, yes, you do see. Thank you, Johanna. Oh, just once again. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, you should see me. Okay. And uh, Tanya Rekovicic raised hand. Okay, so at the QA, we don't have the questions, but at the chat area, we have questions. So uh, thank you, Tanya. Uh, so how do you combine it with meso? And uh, this is something that uh, is very interesting because we should not speak when we are, uh, you know, treating the patient, uh, we should not only speak about what is the volumetric change with the patient's face, but also uh, what is the change of the skin quality. And uh, although there is some, uh, you know, change in the um, uh, skin quality, if we only apply superficially inside of the dermis uh, hyaluronic, uh, cross-link hyaluronic acid, inside of the uh, uh, skin, we should also apply a non-cross-link hyaluronic acid. And here, uh, inside of the upper line brand, we have the Hydro, which is a uh, high concentration non-cross-link hyaluronic acid that we should apply on the area of the face in the, uh, in the injection technique of uh, microdermal papula. If we are using the, uh, the, uh, the, the needle. So with that part, we're going to use it uh, uh, quite well and improve the hydration uh, uh, hydration of the skin, of course, the quality. And uh, we can use that, of course, on the whole face, including the upper area. Of course, here is something that uh, gives uh, uh, an awesome result. But of course, in the area of the uh, neck and decollete, probably even the most, because the cross-link hyaluronic acid there doesn't give the best result, but when combining it with the uh, non-cross-link hyaluronic acid, it gives a major, major improvement. But of course, uh, we can also have a real mesotherapeutic cocktail, which is like the uh, combination of a non-cross-link hyaluronic acid and the uh, some uh, uh, active solutions like uh, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, amino acids inside, and this is going to give us the proper biorevitalization of the skin. And, uh, uh, okay, let me just read because this, uh, uh, this uh, question is a bit longer. Okay, so uh, to answer Christina, so in the uh, temporal area, if you are going to use it with the, uh, uh, with the needle, so I would prefer to go to the, to the bone because you actually don't really know whether you are in the muscle or in some other, other soft tissue. Uh, when you do inject, so when you are on the bone, you know, you do know that generally you are on the bone, there is muscle on top of that, and then you have, don't have any major vessel that you can inject inside or hurt itself. But of course, when you're using the cannula, you don't uh, inject with the cannula that deep because it's very painful. And also you can, you know, uh, you're never sure whether you're uh, as deep as, as you should be. So with the cannula, you eject uh, subcutaneously. So uh, at that uh, part, you are very, um, very, very safe. Okay, so uh, are there any questions? <laughs> so uh, if there are any more questions, I would be happy uh, to answer as well. And uh, I definitely want to, um, uh, to uh, 
thank you everybody for being here. And uh, uh, there is the question, do you combine epiline fillers with threads? So this is like uh, a question depending on the indication. And let's say that we have, that we really want to, uh, in this at least in upper third, we want to lift the eyebrow. And in my uh, personal opinion, uh, I would definitely say that the combination of hyaluronic fillers, because they give volume and also they give projection, and uh, you will have an even better result if you combine it with the lifting threads. So if we have a lifting thread that we are going to apply here and then pull the eyebrow, we're going to have the result that is much, much more uh, like uh, uh, better, more satisfying for the patient. And then of course the, uh, uh, you know, a longer lasting because you're going to have uh, a lot of uh, things uh, there. So uh, yes, I do combine those and it's something that is quite uh, well done. Uh, the, the other thing I would like to say is uh, always work with the uh, high quality hyaluronic fillers uh, and uh, definitely uh, the upper line fillers. They come from uh, the company that is based in Switzerland. So they do uh, comply with the all uh, uh, regulations of the, uh, of the uh, Switzerland and of course, although them being not in the European Union, but the Euro European U Union being the biggest market, they do apply for the uh, uh, all the regulation of the European Union. So they're quite uh, 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 safe to work with and uh, uh, giving you the option that uh, you're having the different uh, uh, cross-linking uh, uh, concentrations uh, percentages, then you're going to to uh, have the option to work uh, with whether you need like a softer filler and then if you need a hydro filler and of course you need a, a hydro for uh, giving it a, a much better quality of the skin. So once again, think not only about the volume which you are going to, uh, 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 to correct with the hyaluronic fillers, don't only think about the uh, mimetic motions of the muscles that you're going to uh, treat with botulinum toxin, but also think about the quality of the skin. Because uh, when we look at the face, even if everything is on the place, like, you know, everything is there, we're going to uh, see and guess, you know, probably the age of the patient because we're going to see that the the skin is having uh, like hydration issues uh, having a problem with the uh, uh, a lot of uh, melasma uh, or hyperpigmentation or maybe having a uh, like uh, uh, some aging problems mainly due to the effect of the sun and of course it is always seeable that the patient that definitely do treat the cells regularly. They come to our offices, they look much, much younger. And uh, once again, uh, then I would definitely uh, uh, like to uh, say, uh, yeah. Uh, so Aperline fillers approved in Serbia, they are on their way. And uh, uh, as soon as that happens, uh, they're going to, uh, you know, promote and uh, to uh, contact all the, the doctors. Uh, thank, uh, thank, thank you, Dragana Boskovic. This is this for you and for the others. And uh, thank you for um, supporting me as a speaker here. And thank you for uh, thank you, uh, Epriline um, and the Cicel company that recognized me as a doctor that would have something 
to say and uh, you know uh, because of you doctors here that are uh, listening to me i'll try to be you know uh, better every time that you come and to prom uh, to give you some more information that we are going that they are going to help you to work with uh, there's another question do we apply filler right under the last third of the brow or just slightly up or under for best lifting effect so this is a very very good question because you know if we apply the filler right above the bro we are going to have actually the uh, 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 the something that is uh, an unwanted result because I, we're not going to have the lifting but that filler is going to pull down the brow so what we really need is to put it a little bit just right below the brow or a little bit even inferior to the brow and of course still being on the bone so not going below the superior orbital margin of the orbita so that is the the place that we are not going to inject when we are lifting the brow but also there is the possibility to inject a hyaluronic filler such as the uh, uh, the upper line normal to fill when we have the sunken orbita to fill this uh, this part or after the blepharoplasty when there is a little bit of uh, asymmetry there we can have the uh, uh, upper line normal being injected either by cannula or by the needle to uh, to cover up like this uh, these problems and uh, I think that would be that so for all of you uh, you definitely saw my uh, uh, Instagram profile I mean, it is at dr.nenad.stankovic and you can follow me on the Instagram and uh, you can uh, ask all your questions there uh, and I will be glad to answer maybe not in a minute but in one day I will definitely answer all of your questions and I will be happy to once again all the best for you and uh, when corona ends i will see you on some beautiful congresses in serbia or around the world once again thank you everybody let me just stop this and leave bye bye